The church is kind of cool. <laughs> I love this. I mean, I'm a pastor, but uh, this is a good place to be because of all of what's going on, because you're here, and because we're all here, and because the presence of Jesus Christ is here and working in us and doing things. And that's really cool. So I want to welcome you this morning. I'm Pastor Jason. I have the honor and privilege of being Horizon's pastor, of serving you all as your pastor, and uh, just very thankful for the opportunity. Um, so you might be wondering why I have this large K on my chest, and uh, you know, I like to make jokes, so there's a lot of really um, poor jokes out there about w- what this means. But uh, there's one joke about Nebraska, the N on their ha- uh, helmet stands for knowledge, right? Because they're busy playing football, they don't know how to spell. I mean, that's, that's a stereotype. Um, so, but if the N stands for knowledge, then the K stands for corn huskers. Uh, <laughs> I know. So, but anyhow, this, this shirt's actually the K in what the staff spelled out as thank you during our volunteer celebration. And on the back, it talks about transformed lives, transform lives. And I think about that. It fits perfectly with, um, with our sermon series because what we talked about a lot recently is being life changed, life changers. And there's this beautiful thing that happens as our lives get changed. Um, we find that it's like that parable where, where we don't just take that, those gifts and, and hide them in a hole and, and then bring them back to the giver, that uh, we're called to, to, to spend them, to use them and multiply them. And, uh, and so that's, uh, our lives get changed and then we get to we invest that and things happen, big things happen in our lives and others' lives. So, uh, so that K is part of that thank you and, and Christ and cool and all kinds of things. Um, but all of this turns out to be um, bringing back to God's word. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 is our focus scripture for this whole sermon series, this whole season looking into next year and we're reminded as Paul says, glory to God who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine. Way beyond all that we can fathom or put in our hearts or, or, or dream about uh, by his power at work within us. That's what Paul says. I'm not making that up. That's God saying, I can do all kinds of crazy things, way more than you can imagine, and I'm going to do it through you. See how cool church is? We get to be part of that. It's an active thing. It's not just remembering that there's some really cool God who who called us into being and then is going to call us home someday. He's calling us every moment of our lives. So today we're going to continue with our sermon series through the book of Acts and uh, in this, uh, this drama that changed the world. Let's go to that next slide. So, um, it, so you'll see what's going on here. And I want you to think about this. As we're studying the first nine chapters of the book of Acts this morning, we call it the book of Acts, but really it's called the book of Acts of the Apostles. That's just a really long title, so we kind of shortened it down a little bit. But um, this is the early church. Remember that they didn't call it the book of beliefs or the book of hopes and dreams. It was called the book of acts, the things that they did. Not just beliefs, not just the needs of the early community, but what they were doing in response to this powerful Holy Spirit and what was working into the community. Reminding us to, uh, to make sure that this ministry looks exactly like that ministry, that we are part of those acts that continue to, uh, to um, strengthen our faith, but also to allow uh, what Jesus is wanting to do in our lives. I want to remind you as we begin to worship this morning that this program that you'll find as you uh, entered into the worship center this morning, on the back side of it, there's a worship outline opportunity for you to, uh, to follow along, to take this home, uh, to study this throughout the week, use it as a devotion, simply keep you grounded. So I invite you to follow along. You'll see some little sun, suns right there that uh, remind you that there's a point on the outline that you can uh, follow along with, reminding us to, to keep grounded. So I want you to, let's just step away. We're talking about church this morning and this thing that we're all doing this morning. And, and you know, because you're here, like, you are the body of Christ. I know that freaks us out sometimes, but um, where two or more are gathered, so is the presence of Jesus Christ. And the church is the body of Christ living in the world today. And we're it. God doesn't care what your week has looked like, what your month has looked like. Um, you're it. You are, we, together, are the body of Christ. I want, I want you to imagine what this all started as. 
So Sarah and I just started a new home group. Um, we wanted to call out some young adults and say, hey, you know, let's, let's try this. So, um, so we meet on Sunday evenings. And last week we were talking about this whole Christian thing and how crazy it is. Jesus and 12 disciples, an unknown person with no status and 12 people, is the equivalent of you going to about seven or eight of your neighbor's homes, depending on if uh, there's, there's a, a couple living together or just one person, about seven or eight homes, and saying, hey, you want to uh, tour Nebraska for three years? So you, those seven or eight neighbors, um, going around Nebraska for about three years and sharing a message. I want you to think about that. There's about a million, million three in Nebraska what sort of impact would you, would you imagine that you would have after three years of going to small towns like Ord and Kearney? And, well, Kearney's not, you know, relatively speaking, he's not small for Nebraska. Scotts Bluff, Shattern, Alliance, down. What sort of impact are you going to have, you and your 12 friends? Maybe it would be huge. I don't want to sell you short here, but that's exactly what Jesus did. 12 people. They went all around, about the region uh, the size of Nebraska. And for him, it was huge. From that small movement, billions of people have come to a relationship with Jesus and also with God, their creator. That's, that's, that's what happens. That's a phenomenon. We can't understand or even imagine that or even think that that might happen for us today. But today we look at that and we want to continue this work. And a lot of times what we do as a church or as what church leaders do, what pastors do, is we go to all these conferences and we read all these books because we are convinced that somehow, somewhere, we're going to discover the key to church growth or we're going to discover how Jesus did it and we're going to find this key and we're going to just stick it right in the lock and and boom, same thing's going to happen. But what's cool about studying the book of Acts, studying the early church, looking at the apostles, looking at what the Holy Spirit was doing in the lives of these young, uh, courageous believers, is that they already knew what it took. They already had the key. They already had all the secrets, all the answers, all the tricks, all the strategies. They knew all along. As we'll see today, they knew that they needed to pray, to invite others, to continue to empower others and to entrust and trust who God was. And this tiny little thing grew up into a thing that not only big and just is is a name, but it changes our lives, it saves our lives, it it redirects us, it allows us to be poured into bigger things that are way bigger than just our lives. Um, it, It makes a huge difference. So I want to invite you to turn to uh, Acts chapter 6 with me today. As a reminder, you can always grab your Bible. There's, a, uh, there's a Bibles available if you don't have one or yours is all beat up. They're always available on the counter inside the, just right inside the worship center here. Otherwise, you can follow along on your smartphone or your, uh, your device, whatever it is, any way that you can follow along with Scripture this morning. Now, as we look into Acts chapter 6 this morning, we are um, reminded of what has happened. So last week we talked about uh, Peter and, uh, and the apostles, and all this crazy cool stuff is happening because they're, they're daily facing this opposition. People are calling them out, threatening them, saying, you've you got to stop this, don't do this anymore, we're going we're gonna to imprison you, and uh, it doesn't matter. They continue to just pour into this because they're so excited. There's no, you should, or you have to, or we're expecting you to. There's no membership. There's no gate that you can't pass unless you pour into the ministry in a certain way. They're just on fire. They're just on fire. Well, what happens, so we, we got into this awesome example of everyone giving to the community and saving lives and, and uh, doing big work in the early church. What happens from then is, uh, again, the Jerusalem council gets together because they do not like what's going on. So they call the apostles, they call Peter in, and again, they, hold, uh, they imprison them, and they say, uh, you better stop talking about Jesus, you better better not preach anymore in that name. They're actually conspiring to kill the apostles, all, all 12 of them at that moment. Like, they're ready to pull the trigger. And they have the power, they have the capacity, the authority to do so. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, but th- these apostles are being held in captivity, and that's possibly the future of their ministry and their journey. 
Uh, and it turns out they released them and let them go. And, and you would think that the apostles would be like, okay, we've hit way too many roadblocks here. We just almost lost our lives, all 12 of us. Maybe we should just simmer down and call it good. But instead, what we see in chapter 6, verse 1, uh, this thing, this is the Holy Spirit work here. This thing's not going away. Verse 1, about that time, while the number of disciples continued to increase, a complaint arose. Greek-speaking disciples accused the Aramaic-speaking disciples because their widows were being overlooked in the daily food service. So the first thing is you have to look at the, there's all this opposition and all of this um, force trying to stop what's going on, and yet it's growing. We're, we're told that the number of disciples continued to increase. There's this fire that's going on. But look what happens. We see this all the time in, in, in the church today, in the early church. The moment that things get going, not only is there opposition from the outer world, but things start heating up internally as well. People begin to bring complaints against them. So as soon as leadership, as soon as this momentum gets going, we, we find that there are often even things that infiltrate into our own hearts and complaints begin to be put forth against the apostles. And they're essentially saying, look, there's, uh, there's some widows over here who you may con- not consider quite as important because they weren't um, Hebrew, eh, he, he, Hebrew Jews from a long time ago, and so you, you might skip them to feed the other widows. But we don't think that's right. So, you know, Peter's listened to this. So verse 2, then the 12 called a meeting of all the disciples and said, okay, we know, we know we have this problem, but Peter says it isn't right for us to set aside the proclamation of God's word in order to serve tables. Brothers and sisters, carefully choose seven well-respected men from among you. They must be well-respected and endowed by the Spirit with exceptional wisdom. So I love this. So first of all, Peter's hearing people, and, and he's saying, okay, I know, there's, I know something's not working here, but he stays the course. You see, as Christians, oftentimes in a, in a big world like this, um, we have a hard time staying the course because a lot of things come in, into our lives, and it's so easy to, to kind of get sidetracked. But Peter says, I know I was called to do this, and so I need to continue to do this one thing, this one thing. So the second thing, he says, brothers and sisters, I want you to choose some people. Now, he doesn't say, brothers and sisters, let me choose some people, and then I'm going to put them here and there. He's giving this beautiful power to the church. And he says, I want you to do this. I want you to go and pray about this and discern seven people who you think would be good, essentially, to join this ministry and to rock and roll, and let's get those widows fed so they don't get overlooked and, and so that they're not being neglected. Let's do this together, and let's build this team, is essentially what Peter's saying. He says, we will put them in charge of this concern. As for us, verse 4, as for us, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the service of proclaiming the word. So Peter is saying, we're going to do our things. This is what God called us to do, but we want to invite you to do your thing because this is how God's going to work through you. It wasn't anyone, it wasn't a lesser job. He was saying, these people have to be well respected, full of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, this proposal pleased the entire community. People say that miracles don't have any, happen anymore. This proposal, pleasing the entire community, wow. Instead of them saying, because this, this happens a lot, right? They say, well, no, you know, Peter, you're the rock. You got to do this. You can't hand this off to someone else. But instead, they're saying, yeah, this sounds like a really good idea. So they selected Stephen, seven men. Stephen, a man endowed with the Holy Spirit with exceptional faith. Philip, Prochorus. Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert from Judaism. The community presented these seven to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. God responds. God does these really cool things and says, okay, I love what you're doing. I love how this thing is growing. You're, you're inviting more people. So verse 7, God's word continued to grow. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased significantly. Even a large group of priests embraced the faith. Now, this is a big deal. At the end, even priests are embracing the faith. See, it's one thing for a Gentile or a Jew to embrace this faith uh, because, you know, they're, they're looking at it and they're saying, man, I, this, there is truth in there. My heart's convicted. But for a faith leader, one who is supposed to be a champion for Judaism and continue to uh, move that faith forward into their communities and, and stand up for it, are, that's big when their hearts are convicted and they're saying, okay, 
I, 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 I don't know what's going on here, but I can't ignore this truth of this uh, crucified and risen Christ and the power that's moving and working in it and through me in it. So this, is a big, this is a big turning point in the, a turning point in the early church's life. We see that, uh, <clears throat> that the growth and the health of the early church uh, teaches us so much about our own community. And uh, we see, uh, we have to remember that as these seven were called, this was a big deal, that there were 12 leaders and now there were seven more. So that almost doubled their leadership capacity here. Um, that it wasn't because it was easier back then that all they had to do was worry about the church and that was it. They didn't have all the uh, soccer practices and baseball games and dance recitals and you know, all that stuff and work-related re- activities. They, you know, they didn't have all that. You have to remember that uh, they, were, they weren't in the vacuum either. Their lives were being threatened. There was opposition in ways that we can't even understand, fathom, or imagine in our lives. And yet, the church was growing. So here's what we learned from this. Now you can follow along on your worship outline uh, some of the lessons that we're learning in Acts chapter 6 this morning. The first thing that we are reminded of is that often this happens to us. We're called to be leaders. There's one reason why Horizons says that we are all about cultivating relationships, transformation, and leadership for life change. There's a reason why we're talking about that because we're, we're called, just like the seven, we're called to join the rest. And uh, what happens though is unintentional leaders often default to doing. We are called to be leaders of leaders, to lead others. And oftentimes what happens though is that uh, we're called to lead something and we end up instead, instead of leading others, we just do it ourselves. It sounds really familiar to, to me uh, as a pastor. So many times I'm looking at something and I was like, oh, I'll just do it, I'll take care of it real quick. It'll be easy. Sometimes we, uh, we default to doing it ourselves because we like the credit. We like to be the one that says, yeah, I built this all by myself. Sometimes uh, it's just, like I said, it's easier to do. Sometimes we're afraid that, that it's not going to get done or we, no one else knows how to do it or it's going to fall apart if we don't do it. But we're reminded, Paul talks about, uh, this is Paul now. Paul is after Peter, but he continues to pour into the early church. He reminds us uh, in his le- first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. He says, after all, what is Apollo? So here's Apollos. He's one of the guys that picked up the torch and was doing all these cool things. And, you know, and then he says, what is Paul? So he's even talking about himself. He's like, who are we? What, we're really, what importance do we play? He says, they are servants who helped you to believe. But then he says this, each one had a role given to them by the Lord. So he's acknowledging that, he's acknowledging that God has called every single person and has given them a certain task. Verse 5, he says, I planted, then Apollos watered. He says, but God made it grow. Because of this, neither the, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But the only one who is anything is God who makes it grow. So he's saying you're all called to this because God's going to work through you. Just like Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, glory to God who's able to do far beyond all that you can ask or imagine by his power at work within you. It doesn't matter who's planting, who's watering, that you're called to it because God wants to work through you. Verse 8, the one who plants and the one who waters work together, but each one will receive their own reward for their own labor. We are God's co-workers and you are God's field, God's building. It's kind of a cool concept to know that we are God's co-workers, called to big things, called to, to, to pour out our lives in, in big and, and tiny little small ways, simple ways, ways that come so naturally because we're working alongside God and God's working in and through us. Verse 10, I've laid a foundation like a wise master, builder according to God's grace that was given to me, but someone else is building on top of it. Each person needs to pay attention to the way they build on it seeing how God has called each of us to be a part of this. Next thing we know about, uh, about leadership, about how uh, the early church was setting this example for all of us, next thing in your worship outline this morning, is not inviting others, is suffocating. Not inviting others is suffocating. 
So, uh, you know, we're continuing to have new house adventures at our house, and uh, our, our house has, it was built in 1941, has two fireplaces, and Sarah and I were really excited about having some fires in the fireplace, but um, I don't know, I need to get a book on how to build fires, something, something's not working out here, because if you walk into my house right now, um, it's going to smell like we had a campfire inside, <laughs> because uh, for whatever it's worth, um, I'm stacking the wood, and I had someone come out and kind of show me what to do here, but um, uh, I can't seem to get this thing to take a good blaze and just burn, you know? And um, so oftentimes what I get is I get these billows of smoke, and they're just like... (laughs) The smoke alarms start going off, and we start opening all the windows. What's the point of that? You're going to heat your house so you can open all the windows. Uh, but one of the things that I'm constantly reminded is that oftentimes, see, I just don't know quite the right mix of, um, sometimes I'm not giving the, the fire enough, um, enough oxygen. It can't breathe. So I'm suffocating it because I'm not giving it the things it needs. Sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm really conservative when it comes to fires, so I don't give it enough wood. I'm not giving it enough energy to burn. So I get this smoky house instead. But see, not inviting others is suffocating. Just light that fire. Not inviting others, is the next point on your outline, is also um, an, an act of sin. And I know you're going to think that sounds a little bit crazy, but uh, so Paul continues in his first letter to the Corinth in chapter 12, and uh, verses 18 through 24, and he, uh, he says this, chapter 12, verse 18, but, it, but as it is, God has placed each one of the parts of the body just like he wanted it. If all were one and the same body part, what would happen to that body? So Paul's talking about the body of Christ. Just like I said this morning, that's us. Look around. You are part of the body of Christ this morning. What would happen if all of us decided to be ears, he says? What would happen to the body? Verse 20, but as it is, there are many parts to one body. So the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Or in turn, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Instead, the parts of the body that people think are the weakest are the most necessary, and the parts of the body we think are less honorable are the ones we honor the most. The private parts of our body that aren't presentable are the ones that are given the most dignity. The parts of our body that are presentable don't need this. Paul, you hear what Paul's saying? He's talking about this body because he knows the history of this early church and what had happened and how much momentum they got and how much they were changing the world. We're reminded last week we talked about there was not a single needy person in their community because this early church, they knew they could and they did. And God was working through them in so many ways. And Paul's saying, I want more of this. We can do this. But we all get to be part of of the body of the Christ, a body of Christ. So in that, we see that uh, oftentimes when we don't invite others, it does become sinful. Because oftentimes there's this bit of arrogance or pride in our inability or our unwillingness to invite others. Oftentimes um, when we don't invite others into the ministry, when we don't invite others to continue to be a part of the body of the Christ, when we don't invite people to continue to be a part of what the Holy Spirit's doing. To grow. Build this relationship with Jesus Christ. I tell you what, there's nothing more powerful than when we do something. It doesn't mean it matter if you're scrubbing toilets or if you're welcoming people uh, as they come to worship or you're uh, taking your first stab at uh, running the slides on a Sunday morning or whatever it is that you're doing. It makes a difference. And when you realize that you're playing a part in ministry, and it just it knocks us off our seats. It is life-changing to know that God chose us in so many of these ways. And that relationship does really big things when we say, God, I'm not like all these other awesome, good church people who, who, uh, who seem to have this really, really, really good, strong faith and they do all the things right. I'm not like that. Why did you use me? Or how, you, I think you made a mistake. But it's huge because then we learn about grace. We learn about this relationship. So I want you to think about this. Imagine what would have happened to the early church if Peter and the original 12 would have said, oh man, we're not feeding all the widows. We better stop proclaiming the word. Let's switch gears and let's just start feeding people. We can't let that fall and we're going to try to do it all ourselves. 
we wouldn't be here today. The church wouldn't exist if Peter and his apostles would have lost their focus, tried to do it all, kept other people away from the ministry, and tried to do it all. How long would have that church had survived? They wouldn't have been able to continue serving others, and they, and they would be waiting tables, and they would be helping the widows, and the next thing someone else would come and say, hey, you guys, you're not doing this either, and then they'd switch gears, and then the church, the early church, the thing that, w- that keeps us alive today falls apart relationships that, were, that would grow and establish because of that uh, serving and, and Jesus working through them would have never happened had Peter and Paul, and, well, not Paul yet, uh, Peter and the apostles decided to just try to do it all themselves. So we're bringing it at home because we're looking at the early church and we're looking at what they did and we're like, okay, this is awesome. I, we're really glad that they chose to do that. What does it mean for us so we're in our sermon series right now, uh, and it's a huge reflection on what happens next year. See, one of the, this time of year, we have the opportunity to look at 2015. We look at 2014, and we say, man, it's been one smoking year. Uh, we built this patio, and, and, and now the neighborhood is getting to know who Horizons is, and, and their children are playing out in front, uh, shooting hoops and doing things like that. And then we uh, had splash, splash and bash, and we had over a thousand people from the community come and be a part of what we're doing. And then we had VBS, and we just destroyed the numbers and the records that we had before. And 544 kids, 350 some volunteers are pouring into this place and talking about who Jesus Christ is. Constantly on the hill came up a bunch of leaders supported that we had the highest number of people and they're learning again about who Jesus is about who we are as Jesus people in the community and being able to take that step into the future of their own lives as a community garden that's been feeding people fresh vegetables 2014 was a smoking year but now we look at 2015 and we say God what's next yeah, some of us are tired. You know, maybe we need to, you know, just uh, take a breather for a little bit. But for the big part, we're not done yet. This is only the beginning. So we're looking at this. And I, I'm imagining by now that you probably got a little card in the mail um, from, from Sarah and me and from the church, from the steering team, inviting you to be a part of Horizons in 2015. And this, you actually got it on your seat today. Isn't that convenient? Because we know that some of you are like, oh, it's this really thick envelope. I don't know what to do with it. And it accidentally gets in the recycling. Um, <laughs> or it's, you know, it's, um, it's under that big pile of the, gosh, that's overwhelming. Um, or, you know, we know uh, that it goes all sorts of places. But we give you this card, and it's focusing on our time, on our talents, and our treasure. Because we are the early church we are the continuation of what's happening in the acts of the apostles. And we have this opportunity to, uh, to look at the leadership that's already there and to join, just like those seven did, and started rocking and rolling in the church, taking care of the widows that were otherwise being neglected. So we have this opportunity. Again, there's no mistake that we're talking about relationships, transformation, and leadership here at Horizons. Because this is what we're trying to do. Be that early church that continues to change the world in big and tiny, small ways. So what I want you to know is that uh, through all of this, that we're not inviting, or excuse me, we're not trying to hand off ministries when we're, uh, when we're inviting you to, to offer your time, your talents, your treasure. Oftentimes, you know, a lot of, uh, you might hear it sometimes, but that's not what we're focused on. It's not like, well, I'm tired of doing it, so I'm going to hand it off to someone else. Or sometimes people think, well, they're just trying to get us to do all the work, distribute the burden. That's not what we're trying to do. You see, at Horizons, our goal is, and our constant focus, and we keep ourselves accountable to this, is that we are inviting others, as many as we can, to continue to be a part of the ministry with us because it is mind, heart, and life-blowing when God starts working through us and we see what we can accomplish in the world. We are opening up opportunities for others to live into this, their purpose, and this beautiful relationship with Jesus Christ who's not just waiting for you to come home, who's waiting for you to, to today to be a part of this, to see, feel that energy and that movement. So we take it to the streets. We're called to be life-changed life-changers, to let our lives be changed and to let our life-changed lives change others.
We're reminded that if we're not serving, if we're not leading, if we don't have an opportunity, then the chance is we're not growing. See, a lot of people in Horizons Past have said, you know, I can't go to this church anymore because I'm not growing. You know, my kids, they love it, but I'm not growing. If you want to grow, learn to serve, learn to lead. 